have Nick Kane and uh, Justin Kane who will uh, describe. Great, thanks for that introduction. So uh, my name is Nicholas Kane. I'm a software engineer. I'm actually a, a research scientist turned software engineer. I've been uh, doing coding uh, in the technology group at the Institute for uh, about the last year. But before that, uh, for five years, I was in the modeling analysis and theory group. And uh, I'm joined today, uh, Justin, do you want to introduce yourself real quick at the beginning? I'm uh, Justin Higgins. I'm a scientist in the, in the neural coding group at the, at the Institute. I've been there for about two years. Yeah. So today we're going to be uh, giving you a guided uh, interactive tour of some of the data and uh, software resources that the Allen Institute has been producing for some of our major web products. Um, can everybody hear me in the back? Am I speaking loud enough? Good? All right. The acoustics in here are very interesting. I can, it sounds much louder than I remember being. All right. So this is going to be the menu for the day. Uh, uh, they, said they, they said that it couldn't be done uh, to introduce the mouse connectivity atlas, the common coordinate framework, the cell types atlas, and the brain observatory uh, in the context of, uh, of data. We're going to try to do it because uh, we have two hours. So uh, Justin and I have taken an approach today of uh, sort of tag teaming a presentation where I'll be covering a, a sort of breadth, uh, the first three bullet points there, uh, mouse connectivity, common coordinate framework, cell types. Uh, and then Justin's going to give a bit more of a deep dive type tutorial based uh, presentation on the Allen Brain Observatory. Eva gave a great uh, introduction to it uh, in the presentation you just saw. And uh, hopefully we're going to be uh, extending uh, what she uh, presented, giving you a little bit more background and then also getting your hands dirty with some code and some data. Being that this is a hackathon and not like a traditional you know, conference uh, type presentation, we really have a goal in mind of getting this data into your hands. What is the data? How can you view it, either by the website or downloading it and plotting it uh, using some Python code and then accessing it to drive uh, your uh, uh, models and analyses that you want to run? So if we accomplish this goal, we'll really, uh, we'll really have done our job. So we're going to be doing all of this work through uh, the Allen SDK, uh, which is a Python API that allows access to the data uh, uh, from our, that's held on our, on our website. And there's going to be two modes to interact with this data. So I want to highlight this at the beginning. After, after you pay attention to this part, then you can sort of zone out for a little while while I do the introduction. Uh, either the data can be cached locally onto your laptop. And uh, the, the, the Allen SDK will take care of that for you. It'll make these things called uh, uh, brain observatory caches or, or mouse connectivity caches locally on your hard disk. The data sets can get pretty big, something on the order of a couple hundred megs per data set at its largest. Um, so bear that in mind since we're all on laptops and space is sort of constrained. But actually, Justin will be working on a tutorial that's cloud-based. We actually have some brain observatory data that have been preloaded up into an S3 bucket. And he'll be using SageMaker uh, to uh, guide you through uh, Jupyter notebooks that interact with that data in the cloud. So there'll be two mechanisms. And, uh, and hopefully, that'll be more than enough introduction to get you guys uh, going so that uh, uh, leading into next week, you can really hit it hard and, and, and use this data if you want, if you want to. All right, so uh, the Allen Institute uh, was founded in 2003. Uh, we're just down the street there on the, on the right-hand side of that picture. You can see this, uh, a view from the south to the north of Lake Union. So uh, uh, we moved into that building a few years ago. Uh, uh, in 2014, the uh, Cell Science Institute was announced. And they're actually housed on the fifth floor of our building uh, together with us. And then recently, uh, the Frontiers Group has occupied the, the top floor there. So we're down in South Lake Union. Um, I've been there for, I guess, six years now, and Justin for a couple years. And uh, uh, we're really glad to have a, a, a really cool spot there on Lake Union. And over the, uh, the years that the Allen has been there, there's been a sort of a progression of web resources that uh, we've been putting out. Uh, one of the really important things is that our data is available for public use. We don't uh, charge for downloading the data. We don't even make you uh, register in any way or you know, get a username and password and anything like that. Um, in order to access any of the data resources we'll be talking about, uh, do we have a laser pointer? I do not. May I borrow it? Thank you. So, uh, so Initially, a lot of people we were most famous for the cell type data, or excuse me, for the uh, the uh, mouse brain atlas. After that, the human atlas and a lot of other studies went on. Today, uh, Justin and I will be highlighting the three atlases that are boxed here: the the connectivity atlas, the cell types database, and the brain observatory. Um, great, thank you very much. 
So uh, actually, when I started back in, 20, in 2012, one of my first projects was to work on uh, the Connectivity Atlas. So that's going to be where I'm going to start uh, my presentation. Um, uh, yeah, how many people have heard of the Allen Institute? And keep your hand up, uh, or put your hands down if you've never used any of the data. OK, a couple people have used the data. Uh, uh, raise your hand if you've used the Allen SDK. OK, fantastic. So we have, some, we have some experts in the house. So next week, you'll be the go-to people. I hope you saw who that was. All right. So uh, uh, we'll be framing our talk here sort of as an outline. Um, these three different uh, resources we'll be talking about. On the one hand, we're look interested in, in examining what the components of the, of the brain are in isolation, the individual neurons and their response properties. We're also uh, looking at the wiring logic and how these different components are all tied together. We'll be talking about the connectivity atlas at the mesoscale, so looking at region-to-region -region connectivity as opposed to individual neuron connectivity. But uh, what is the wiring logic? And then, after these cells are characterized and wired up, what is their response properties? And can we start to get a sense of how they compute inside the brain? That's sort of the domain of the Allen Brain Observatory. So to give you a little bit more detail, the Mouse Connectivity Atlas is a brain-wide axonal uh, projection map. It uses uh, 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 viral techniques in order to identify cell populations of interest and express green fluorescent protein inside of the axonal projections of those neurons. They can then be imaged and reconstructed in order to create essentially a map of what areas project to what areas in the mouse brain. And it's a, a whole brain atlas, not just the visual cortex. Uh, also, we'll be presenting the, very briefly, we'll see less emphasis here, but on the cell types database, which is a morphological, electrophysiological, and now transcriptomic uh, survey of the different uh, uh, cell types in the mouse. And one a very important addition uh, as of last year was the incorporation of more than, I think it's more than 300 uh, human cells, which are taken uh, from, uh, which would normally be surgical waste uh, uh, that's removed on the way to uh, uh, do neurosurgery to ablate like epileptic foci. But those uh, tissues that are removed in order to get access to the, 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 the tissue in the human subject is actually uh, taken. Um, it can be uh, sliced, put on, a, you know, put in uh, artificial cerebral spinal fluid, and then recorded just with the same patch clamp type recordings that the, the brain, the mouse brain slices are done. So it's a new addition to the, to the cell types database that makes it very unique. And then finally, the, uh, the visual coding Allen Brain Observatory is the uh, uh, optical physiology uh, of awake uh, uh, mice that are uh, uh, seeing different types of stimuli, gratings, natural scenes, natural movies. This is the, the resource that uh, we'll be going into much greater detail when sort of in the second half of the presentation. So next, I'll be introducing the, uh, the Allen SDK. It's a Python API. It's a pip installable. If you just pip install Allen SDK, you can bring it onto your local laptop uh, if you're familiar with how to install Python packages. And this provides programmatic access to not only the data itself, but also uh, the database of the metadata. So you can structure queries in order to find data sets of interest, if you're interested in a particular uh, region, if you're in the mouse, or if you're in the cell types database, you want to look at human tissue as, or human cells as opposed to mouse cells. You can run those types of queries locally, programmatically, and then pull out that data and analyze it uh, uh, yourself. Um, so, uh, so I'll be going into uh, great detail about how to uh, uh, use the Allen SDK to access these uh, uh, pieces of data. So this is the, what the main website looks like. I put this in here in case my internet connection doesn't work. But I'm going to switch over, and I'll be doing this periodically through the presentation, sort of switching to the web browser in order to, uh, in order to, to show you. You can follow along. Um, if you like, if you just Google uh, uh, Allen SDK, just one word, it's usually the top link that shows up. And so you can see over here uh, the data resources, uh, brain observatory, cell types, mouse connectivity, and then I'll be talking also about the reference space and just very briefly about the API access. Uh, so we're going to try to cover all of these topics, uh, which is a bit ambitious, and we won't be able to go into the sort of full scientific detail of each of these. Rather, again, the goal is to try to get this data into your hands. And also, I should invite questions. If you, have, if you need me to slow down or if I'm being unclear about something, uh, definitely raise your hand, and, and I'll try to, try to answer your questions. All right, so, so if you come into any one of these uh, different resources, uh, here we have uh, an illustrate, uh, just sort of summary information. 
the cell types database is unique because we actually have uh, uh, models that have been fit, both, bio, both uh, biophysically detailed and sort of more abstract uh, leaking and grating fire models. And that, those models are actually available for download too in the cell types database. Um, if you come up to one of these tabs and click in, uh, a little bit of detail about the experiments, um, sort of describing, uh, giving enough context to interpret the results that'll come from your API queries is uh, uh, available. So I would suggest this as this one-stop shop for, uh, oh, I'm really confused, what is, this, what is this data? Where is the documentation? This is gonna be the place you're gonna go. And then uh, down here, uh, each of these individual resources has an associated Jupyter Notebook. Um, the one that Justin's going to present is actually a very recent one that's, um, uh, I, I think it's a pretty big improvement on what's currently available for the Brain Observatory. So uh, that Jupyter Notebook and the other ones that I'll be presenting will be available for you in this uh, cloud instance that we'll touch later today. So yeah, lots of details, also links to the technical white papers, um, all sorts of information is available. Uh, uh, from this uh, web page associated with the Allen SDK. And then finally, the API access. Uh, I just wanted to, to touch on this so that we don't confuse our terminology. When I'm going to be using the word API, I'll be talking about essentially the uh, Python API that is a part component of the Allen SDK. It essentially wraps a RESTful API that you could also use in order to query the Allen resources, actually way more uh, resources than are available uh, through the Python API. Uh, but essentially it just provides a convenience wrapper for, for and, and, and sort of it's uh, self-documenting so you can access data. But there's a ton of data available through RMA queries. Um, and so this is the, uh, the page if you want to really dig deep and there's, or if you're interested in some of the other uh, uh, web resources like the, um, the, uh, the gene expression atlases or some of the more uh, obscure atlases like the glioblastoma atlas. Some of that data is available through the RESTful API, but it's not as well documented. All right, so that's a tour of the main web page of the Allen SDK. Now I'm going to uh, go into each of the individual uh, databases themselves and then pull up some Jupyter Notebooks that actually show you some code uh, that you can use as sort of a reference as you move forward and uh, uh, working later next week. So what is the Mouse Connectivity Atlas? Uh, uh, this is the, the platform manuscript for the wild type uh, version of the experiment. It's a whole, whole brain mesoscale projectome. projectome. It was done in a very st uh, uh, standardized fashion and uh, it's actually a composite of I think more than 2,000 experiments that have all been co-registered to the same anatomical coordinate system. So uh, when you see a projection from say VizP to LGN and then a, another projection from LGN back to VizP, those are actually two different experiments, two different viral injections into the source areas that have been co-registered and put into a composite together. So this is actually kind of a, a, a multi-experiment um, and uh, uh, using highly standardized stereotactic injection coordinates and, um, and, uh, and, 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 and methods and instrumentation. And one of the things that I, I, when I came onto this project, I was very interested as a, you know, a newly minted computational neuroscientist. I was interested in uh, computational network analysis, uh, looking at uh, what types of connectivity motifs, are there hubs in the, in the, uh, 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 in the connectivity that aren't obviously apparent in the, in the gross anatomy. So those are the types of questions that I was interested in, but there's all sorts of anatomical questions, uh, uh, looking at biases and different types of uh, 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 projections. And then also uh, in the second version of the study, uh, the projections are done by Cree line. So they're basically subsampling genetically uh, subpopulations of cells to express the marker for the green fluorescent protein to trace the axons, which gives you sort of uh, a cell type specific projection map. Uh, although uh, the coverage is not as complete as the wild type injections, but that's a uh, another uh, aspect of this data that makes it very unique, both in terms of its scale and in terms of its uh, genetic expression um, uh, character characteristic. 
So I think figure one in the paper is, uh, looks something like this. On the rows, we have different uh, uh, source injections. So each row is going to be a different experiment. Like I said, it's sort of a composite of multiple experiments. And across the columns are uh, the different regions that the signal that was seen in those different regions are, are accumulated inside. So you can think of this kind of like a heat map or uh, uh, for, for each individual experiment. And the reason I bring this up is because what it's not is a directed acyclic graph. So if you're familiar with graph terminology, this is not a weighted directed graph. And uh, I was, when I first came onto the data set, I was like, wow, this is going to be so cool. I'm just going to you know, throw this into my favorite you know, hub detection algorithm and boom, paper. Well, not so fast. Uh, we actually have to take this data and infer from it a uh, weighted directed graph that is sort of consistent with the data. So that's what this is on the right. This is my first, uh, my first project at the Institute was trying to develop that graph. So this is what I think I wanted when I started. These are uh, the source regions and target regions, not experiments by regions. Um, and the color intensity is the, is the, uh, the intensity of the projection uh, masked by p-value. So uh, these data are available uh, associated with the manuscript uh, online. And then these are some other fu summary figures from later in the paper that are uh, uh, detailing the cortical thalamic and thalatocortical uh, uh, projections in the, in the, that are present in the data. The data is collected uh, one, one brain at a time by starting and doing a stereotaxic injection into some, it's kind of hard to see this, this gray image. Uh, uh, picking a, a stereotaxic coordinate or a functionally, inject, uh, functionally defined uh, source. Um, I'll, I'll say more about that later. But picking a source for the viral injection, uh, uh, the virus infects the cells inside that little zone and then uh, uh, over the course of several weeks expresses green fluorescent protein through the axons. But those, uh, the virus doesn't hop from one neuron to another. It's, it's only expressing the neurons that have a soma inside the injection source. We're not talking about the, the retrograde experiment. This is just the AAV experiment. And then uh, 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 the brain is then uh, uh, serially sectioned and scanned with a two-photon microscope, uh, uh, serial two-photon tomography, so that uh, you can see in sort of uh, 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 sections the progression of the, uh, the axons as they move from uh, uh, between the different brain regions. And then uh, there's a reconstruction that is uh, applied afterwards in order to collect that data back together and actually mark the projection patterns. And then that data is co-registered uh, together into a coordinate system we call the common coordinate system. How thick are those slices? Uh, 100 microns. Yeah, uh, the sectioning happens at a physical section of 100 microns that typically causes, the vibratome causes a bit of damage to the top, you know, several microns. So the actual imaging happens, I think, it's something like 20 microns or 15 microns. It's in the methods. That's below the damage profile of the, of the vibratome. Yeah. No, just anterior grade. Correct. Well, it's it's express. It's mostly it's mostly expressing. It's what I, when I thought you what I thought you meant by retrograde was back into another neuron that is projecting to the neuron. So in other words, it's not like a rabies virus that would hop a synapse, but it is expressing, although not as intensely. <coughs> yeah, it's really. And uh, there's I'll get hopefully I'll get to this uh, soon. There's uh, several different versions now of the experiment. I'm really sort of explaining the basic version of the experiment. There's a synaptophysin labeling uh, um, a reporter that really expresses GFP that uh, mostly binds to the synapses. Uh, so that's a, a subset of the data is the synaptophysin experiment. And there's a second experiment or a, another version of the experiment, which is actually a dual labeling strategy, where if I remember right. Uh, a second type of virus is injected in a target area, and only neurons, it, and ah, that's it. Uh, and uh, the virus carries a cassette that can express Cree, and Cree, and then, and then the, the, the uh, AAV will only then express GFP in the presence of the Cree, which it would have been communicated to via the target. So you only have external projections between the source and the target. You also have all the other projections from the source areas elsewhere because the neuron doesn't just project to one place. So that's another version of the experiment. So there's a, there's a bit of nuance there. And uh, I, I don't know if those papers have been published yet, but it's detailed in the, in the white papers associated with the data set. It's a great question. Other questions? 
So in summary then, although it's kind of hard to see here, uh, this is a contact sheet summarizing what is essentially the raw data, right? This is just uh, 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 serial sections of images. Those images individually have to be turned into some sort of quantifiable, thank you, uh, quantifiable signal. And so there's a, uh, a signal detection algorithm that goes in and something like a watershed, fast marching kind of thing that I don't really know a lot about. Uh, some image processing is done to segment out the green fluorescent protein in this image and then uh, uh, the uh, pixels that are inside the interior of those identified regions are counted as sort of projection signal. And then the fraction of projection signal is essentially the, um, the, uh, the projection density in a given voxel uh, in, the, in the experiment. So the goal here is to take raw data and turn it into something quantifiable. Because when we can get into the quantified space, then we can start to run you know, our numerical algorithms, our clusterings, our uh, fast marching algorithms, things like that, um, that we wouldn't be able to do on just raw image tiles. So this is what uh, constitutes the, uh, the, uh, the actual quantified signal that is available through the SDK. Uh, so, this is a, now a top-down view from one experiment where there was an injection here, and then this neuron projected to lots of different places, a pretty big injection. In the Cree version of this experiment, the, the virus that's injected has a, has a uh, different orientation for the green fluorescent protein cassette. So only in the presence of Cree, which is only in a certain sub population of neurons, can this cassette actually be flipped the right direction, and then transcription can happen, and then we see the GFP in the areas. That's how you get the, the genetic restriction of the reporter. Additionally, uh, uh, there's a, uh, a, a another set of experiments that are actually mapping the retinal projectome. These are Cree experiments on a retinal sort of whole mount. Uh, here that actually traces, uh, and then after the in infection in the retina, we can see the retinal projection pathways into the LGN and the spherical colliculus. I think that's right. I'm not a neuroanatomist, but I think that's right. Uh, uh, so this uh, data set, um, stratified by, by Creline, is also available. This is what I would, oh, and then there's the uh, targeting of different functional areas. Um, this was really done, uh, uh, intended to give a little bit more accuracy. Instead of using stereotaxic coordinates, you may be sort of kind of shooting blind, not knowing exactly what area uh, uh, specifically you're infecting. We'd like to get much more accurate. And so before uh, injecting the virus, you can do a, um, a mapping of the, of the visual cortex to identify primary visual cortex and secondary areas, and then target functionally, uh, and you can hit even uh, uh, different uh, parts of the retinotopy in visual space. So there's another subset of experiments that were targeted with functional mapping instead of stereotaxic coordinates. And these are all sort of components of metadata that you can query with the SDK. Right. Uh, and then each of these experiments uh, is then co-registered into this uh, coordinate system we call the common coordinate system. And actually, the imaging from the uh, 1,000 of these experiments was actually used to generate that, uh, that, uh, that coordinate system. So I'll go through that in a little bit more detail. But first, I wanted to show you uh, essentially how to browse the data on your own. So if you have your web browser open, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. Like I said, I'm going to try to target breadth instead of depth for this data set. But um, if you pull up your web browser and go to brainmap.org. This is a sort of overview location. And then the second pip over has the mouse connectivity atlas. So this is how you would access this data in the website. And so what you see is sort of a heads up display superimposed across uh, all of the different uh, 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 injection sites. Each, each dot is a different experiment. And this is rotatable, so you can see that uh, uh, there were more experiments targeted in the right hemisphere as opposed to the left, but a lot more visual cortex experiments in the left. And I believe these are the uh, uh, targeted experiments, functionally targeted experiments. If you want to subselect that down to say experiments just in the isocortex, you can do that here. And then this will mask those out, and then you can come down here and select a given experiment, like say this one. It's not a particularly exciting one, only some small projections here. Let me see if I can find one that has more signal. When you say signal. the subset are functionally mapped, yeah. um, how do you find, do you mean in terms of 
optophysiology? Yeah, so there's essentially uh, uh, a procedure done with, uh, do you want to speak, do you, do you know the details of this uh, part of the experiment? It's, all, it's the same as Brain Observatory. It's the same as Brain Observatory. Yeah. yeah, but I don't know a lot of the details of it. Um, essentially, uh, uh, an, intrinsic, an intrinsic signal image is acquired using wide field, um, I believe it's after the craniotomy, through the, through the glass cover slip, uh, where the, the mouse is um, presented uh, scanning horizontal and vertical bars that uh, 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 will result in two different uh, regimes of signal that can be acquired in, in the two different cases. And then something like level sets of, 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 of activity are computed in the two cases, because as you sweep across retinotopy, you're basically sweeping a wave across retinotopy, or across the cortex in one way, and then another way in the other way. And then you compute the cosine between the level set, the, the vectors of those things, and that determines whether it's blue or red. That's all I know. <laughs> <laughs> basically, what you're, basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to, to as, as, you, as you go from one visual space to another, there's this inversion that takes place in terms of the retinal topic. And so it, it's basically uh, yeah, by scanning and, 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 and exposing the entire visual cortex to retinal topic areas, we can identify when the retinal topic flips, and those become the boundaries between the visual regions that we identify. But those ISI data sets are not online, correct? They or are. Well, the, is the raw ISI? I don't think the ISI, oh, the I, no, the the raw ISI data sign sets, maps the sign maps are, the, the sign raw data that feeds into it is not. I see. Okay. Yeah. Let, let me see if I can actually pull up the sign map, if I remember where it is on the website. I'd be very impressed with myself. Yeah, it's the, it's the, same, it's the same method that, that all of the visual regions in Brain Observatory, uh, it's the same method that's used to identify visual regions in Brain Observatory. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. oh, I cannot remember where the button is. It's been a while since I've thought about this. Ah, here we are. It does not look like this was an ISI experiment. Uh, this is the top-down view on the left here, and if it is an ISI experiment, there will be a button where you can actually see the ISI cosine map in red and blue for the orientation. Um, uh, superimposed on this image. Uh, maybe offline I can try to find one that, that does that. So, so what I'd like to do though is come up here and highlight it. If you're browsing through these experiments, you find one that you're particularly interested in. If you uh, copy this experiment ID number, I'm going to show you a beta feature that was just brought out in the last release um, that is not particularly well, or it's intentionally uh, not uh, uh, broadcast too loudly, but in our latest data release, uh, down here, there's the Allen Brain Explorer. Uh, the Allen Brain Explorer was a standalone desktop application as of, I think, uh, yeah, I think it started back when this experiment was first done. Uh, so that would be like 2012 or 2013. But now there's actually an online version of this that does the Brain Explorer in your web browser. So uh, this is the uh, Allen Brain Explorer. Notice it's in beta. Um, and what I can do is paste that particular ID number up here. And it doesn't take very long to cache. Um, you'll see it'll be loading here for just a, you know, maybe 30 seconds or maybe less. And then what you see is actually the projections uh, of that, uh, uh, the actual three-dimensional projection for that experiment. I'm going to turn off the grid and turn back on the reference planes so you can see how we're sort of oriented. So here's the, the nose and the tail, rostral caudal axis. And then if you come down here, there's a whole list of structures that you can click on and unhide them. And you, these will actually be superimposed in the coordinate system. So this is now the isocortex. I'll take off the reference planes. So you can actually see this particular experiment embedded together with the three-dimensional representation of that structure. We can turn on the transparency so you can see through that structure. And if you click on any point in this three-dimensional space, you actually get the XYZ common coordinate framework coordinate for that place that you clicked. That's pretty cool. Um, 
I'm using this as a segue to the common coordinate framework because how do you compute this, this, this volume, right? Well, it turns out it comes from the raw data of the experiment that I just showed you. Um, common coordinate framework. All right. So essentially, in order to do co-registration of all these data sets, you need a good template to work from. But in order to get that template, you need a lot of brains all co-registered. So you have a chicken and the egg problem, chicken and, chicken and egg problem. So which do you get first? And of course, the solution to a problem like that is to iteratively bootstrap. Sorry, let me turn this back on. So we started with the Nissel version from the original mouse connectivity atlas. I'm sorry, from the from the gene expression atlas, and then essentially provide iter uh, an iterative refinement, uh, co-registering, averaging, co-registering, averaging, starting at very coarse uh, representations like 100 micron voxels, going down all the way to 50 and then 10 micron voxels. And if you repeat, rinse, wash, repeat this process multiple times, you end up getting something, this is after 700 brains, this is after 1,200 brains. You can see that the, the accurate, and this is not just an affine transformation, this also has local deformations in order to get the, the sort of micro adjustments just right in the different areas. And uh, you, see, you start to see features like the barrel field pop out after doing this enough times. Um, uh, the, the fine structure in the cerebellum becomes less hazy. Fine structure everywhere becomes less hazy in the hippocampus and the borders of the visual cortex. And then some really thing, really interesting things. This is um, uh, the, the striatum here. And you see this microstructure that is not really visible on the scale of the individual animal, but on the average scale after the deformable registration, you actually see fine neuroanatomical structures start to pop out. So that's the level of detail that results when you, when you average together in this iterative fashion 1,200 brains. And that provides these three-dimensional structures. There's also a, a, a top-down version um, that I just showed when, uh, when Eve asked her, her question for each of these experiments, or for some of these experiments. And uh, there's an additional coordinate system, the flat map coordinate system, that I won't be talking as much about, but it's a cortical depth coordinate system, um, x, y instead of x, y, z, x star, y star instead of x, y, z, following these streamlines through the cortex. And then this is what that intrinsic signal image map looks like. All right, so that's all well and good. You've now shown me how to browse through the data to find maybe a data set of interest in a web browser, but what I really want to do is get the data locally. I want to open up Python. I want to do a query with you know some for loop to find a particular thing. How do I do that? All right, so these Jupyter notebooks that I'll be showing, um, I'll just be sort of demonstrating, um, are available in, uh, in the repository that Justin's going to show later on. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail but, uh, but um, essentially, what you'll do is import. You'll, these will have the Allen SDK already installed. But if you're local, you want to pip install the Allen SDK. And you'll build these things called cache objects. Here's a mouse connectivity cache. And you'll give it a path and uh, 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 this file that will sort of organize uh, where the different uh, data sets are stored on your local system. And then after that, there's a whole bunch of methods that are documented inside the Allen SDK documentation, like get experiments. This will give all the different experiments. Or uh, get this particular experiment. You can see all the different uh, uh, aspects, including like uh, where the what structure was injected, where the X Y Z location of that structure was, uh, what the particular transgenic line, if it was a Cree line uh, uh, animal, uh, uh, and then if we browse all the way down here, do 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 do, we can come up with uh, this this code snippet above will essentially give you an example of how to construct the projection density matrices. Remember I said you have to do a signal uh, segmentation in order to come up with the pixels that were green fluorescent protein in each area. And then if you accumulate those through the different regions like frontal pole or uh, uh, right auditory cortex or I don't know, those are the ones I recognize. Uh, for each individual experiment, then, you can come up with quantified numbers of how much signal was present in that structure in that experiment. And these are the types of things that you can then do clustering analysis on. You can look at differences layer by layer between different Cree lines, those types of analyses. So this is, uh, this is how you would go about doing it. I want to show you one other notebook. 
This is also in the repository. This is the notebook for the reference space, which actually gives you, um, it, the, the organization is necessarily complicated because there's a lot of data here. And we, as, as the ontologies get redrawn, we, 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 we want to maintain backwards compatibility. So there's actually several versions. Uh, so by ontology, I mean what structures are labeled. Uh, what, vo what voxels are labeled as in what structure. That's never, in neuroanatomy, that's never a sort of solved problem. There's always, you know, uh, improvement and refinement that can happen. So this is a, this is a living document, if you will. But uh, uh, there's a structure called a, called a structure tree where essentially every node will be a, a set of voxels, a mask that you can use uh, in three space to mask out a particular structure. And this is essentially what you use to come up with that projection matrix. So it's illustrated down here. This is the uh, uh, 315 is the ID for isocortex. So uh, this is the isocortex mask taken at a particular coronal slice. Uh, so this is what you would use to select out particular structures. And then this should look familiar because this is exactly what's used to generate the uh, reference slices on the Brain Explorer. So it's the same thing in the Brain Explorer, except it's available to you in Python. Very cool. Questions? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, I said this a little bit in the introduction. I kind of went quickly that there's no sort of uh, uh, restriction on the use of the data. Um, you don't have to log in. You don't have to ask permission. You can just use it. We ask. There is a citation policy that's on the website, but it basically says if you use our data, it'd be great if you cite us. So is there a license for the data? Or? Yeah. The data is. Yeah. The data is. I mean, we have a. And it's on the website. We have a term of use that is large, basically non-commercial for research purposes only. If you want to use it for commercial, you have to talk to the legal team and negotiate that kind of stuff. Um, the code is uh, similar. So the Allen SDK itself is under an Allen Institute license that is basically, it's very similar to a BSD3, but with a non-commercial clause. Yep, exactly. Other questions? All right. Oops. So I'm going to go very briefly through the cell types database. I feel bad because it's such an immense amount of work. But essentially, the cell types database, we've, we've looked at the sort of connection properties and the coordinate system that we can align all this data into. These are actually the components uh, uh, of, the, of, the, of, of the brain, the individual pieces. And, uh, Essentially, this experiment tries to identify uh, in the same cell the, the morphology uh, using three-dimensional reconstruction, a little bit different from the type of reconstruction I was talking about, much finer scale, but similar. Uh, uh, the electric physiological properties in response to different types, different types of, of, of stimulus, uh, uh, flat uh, pulses or ramping stimulus or noise stimuli. Uh, and then also the transcriptomic profile that's coming from the, the contents of the cell when it's actually patched onto. So there's a database of uh, ever-growing. Um, it's available through the website. Oh, that's nice. Uh, so I'll just browse over to it really quickly, but it all, I want to highlight that there's both the, the mouse data component and now also the human data component. So if you want to run meta-analyses differentiating how, how the electrophysiological properties differ between mice and humans, of course we can't do transgenic uh, uh, characterization in human, but in the mouse you can, there are Cree-line specific experiments for these uh, recordings. So I'll just browse over to the cell types database really quickly. I think I have it already pulled up. So when you get over here, there's an overview of the data, and then these individual bubbles. Uh, this is what you can click on in order to sort of access cards for each individual experiment. Uh, and of all the different types of data, there are, uh, 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 for each individual experiment, if it was possible, uh, a generalized leak integrate and fire uh, model was fit to the response properties in the data. And then to the morphologies, uh, if the reconstruction was possible uh, and an all passive uh, uh, dendrite model uh, uh, of the cell uh, that can be simulated in neuron, it's like an SWC file if you've done like neuron experiments. Uh, those are available for a subset of the data. Uh, and then for an, an even smaller subset, an all active conductance uh, version of the, of the model is also, uh, can also be fit. 
So if you click on one of these bubbles, I'll click on the, the big one, right? Electrophysiology for the mouse. You can restrict to different types of donor profiles or different types of uh, 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 Cree lines. Um, all sorts of different things. And, uh, there's also, uh, if you really know what you're doing, uh, you can choose different profiles of uh, the response properties of the action potentials in order to subselect data into regimes that you want. And uh, it's great to do this through the website. You can maybe get some uh, broad strokes understanding of the different aspects of the data set, but all of this can also be done programmatically through the Python API. So if you come down here and click on a particular experiment, You'll see there's an experiment ID right here, and then a sort of a one-card summary of all, of all the different sweeps of the, of the patch clamp recording. Um, uh, and then this is the ID that you would use to access the data in the uh, SDK. So I have a Jupyter notebook that I'm also going to just very quickly go over. Here we are. But essentially, it's the same idea, right? There's a cell types cache object that you'll instantiate, which will make a location on your hard disk in order to cache the data locally. Uh, and then you can select out a particular cell specimen ID, grab down the data set, and then sort of, sort of go to it. You can plot the, the uh, uh, voltage as a function of time for each of the different sweeps. Uh, you can filter all the different cells by their metadata. Uh, all this sort of stuff is sort of documented by example here in the Jupyter Notebook. And this is, you get to this through that front Allen SDK page. And so, you know, eventually the, the goal is to try to get to a slide like this where we say, all right, 1,000 cells, 55 electrophysiological properties computed from each cell, five lines of code to get them. Pip install, open up IPython, and then make your cell types cache, grab the data. You want to start clustering? Five lines. Not the mic. Okay. Uh, what questions about the cell types database? No questions. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So uh, next, we'll uh, I'll kick it over to Justin, and uh, uh, he'll talk about the Allen Brain Observatory, and also get you guys set up with an interactive version of these notebooks, and actually go through some code. Okay. Thanks, Nick. Yeah. Can you uh, mm -hmm. merge the board list for me? Sure. On the LSDK. You said live demo. Where's the tutorial right here and get this uh Switch this over to HDMI. Oh, whoops. This is that guy. There we go. And this is our large HDMI. Awesome. Um, okay. Thank you, Nick. So, as far as, so for the the um, what I'm going to talk about over the next, first, I'll give you a little overview of the Allen Brain Observatory, what exactly the data is, what's in it, and then we'll try to um, try to do a live demo and try to dive into to some of the data um, on uh, on AWS. So, the Allen Brain Observatory is a is a comprehensive physi physiological survey of mouse cortical activity. Um, so 
I mean, for, for decades and decades, the visual cortex has been used to develop and test you know, theory, fundamental theories of neural computation. Um, always you know, going back to, to Hubel and Wiesel's feed-forward models with, um, with, with simple and complex cells, and then up through models of invariant object recognition. Um, and so the, one of the key goals of the, of the Allen Brain Observatory was to, to try to get a comprehensive survey of the mouse visual cortex and how it responds to, uh, to, to different types of visual stimuli. And, not just, and, and that includes covering multiple visual cortical areas in the mouse visual cortex, multiple different types of cells in the mouse visual cortex, and multiple different types of visual stimuli. And so the, the fundamental experimental design is that this is two-photon calcium imaging in an awake mouse. Um, who's familiar with calcium imaging? Knows what it is? Okay, so I'll, I'll cover a little bit of, of detail, but the key aspect of, of calcium imaging is that we're able to um, record the neural activity of individual cells by recording videos of, um, of cells that are active. And so we have uh, um, mice that are on, how do I get over to, so we have mice that are, um, that are on a running wheel with a screen on one side of their, um, on, their, their on their right side. Um, and we have a microscope that is, uh, that is affixed above their head. Um, and so we can uh, use two photon imaging to record activity from individual cells, fluorescent activity. These cells are, are genetically encoded so that when the cell is active, um, uh, when, the, when the cell has, has a calcium influx into it, it fluoresces under, under a laser. Um, and so we can record the, the activity of individual cells. We, can, we record a video of the, of the mouse's eye motion so that we can track where it's looking on the screen uh, during, the, during the experiment. So this is, these, these data are generated through, a, through a high f um, this high throughput uh, pipeline. We have multiple teams at the institute that are responsible for different pieces of the pipeline. So all mice uh, go through a surgical procedure where they uh, are implanted with a, um, with a consistent head frame um, that, that has a, uh, a window in it to, to permit access to, to recording from the visual cortex. They go through an intrinsic signal imaging procedure that we were talking about earlier where um, we just present drifting uh, gratings on the screen and from that we're able to identify where the, the boundaries are between different visual cortical regions. Once we, I, and we are able to get, get sort of a, a coarse understanding of the, of the local retinotopy of, uh, of cells in a given area. From that, we can target a particular area of the, of the retinotopic field consistently. Um, animals are habituated to the, to the recording chamber, and then we move into the, the actual two-photon imaging procedure where we record, for, uh, where, where we record uh, visual cortical activity as we present different types of visual stimuli. And then we go through a serial two-photon uh, imaging procedure afterwards in order to, um, in order to confirm uh, location of, of, um, of uh, genetic uh, of, the, the, um, of, the, of the cells that were part of the experiment um, and co-register everything to the uh, common coordinate framework. <clears throat> One of the key things that we go through is a, is a very rigorous QC process to, to very carefully um, uh, set, our, set very well-defined standards for the data that we generate. Um, and so we, um, uh, not all uh, mice make it through the entire pipeline. Um, and so we have uh, 221 mice that have uh, so far contributed to this data set. Um, ooh, that's fun. So uh, we basically have different types of metadata that's, uh, that's associated with, with each of these steps. So in particular, we end up with the retinotopic targeting from the visual area segmentation. 
During the actual recordings, um, we go through with a lot of post-processing uh, motion correction of the calcium movies, segmentation of individual cells, extracting the fluorescent se signal, um, subtracting off uh, neuropil contamination, demixing uh, cells that might over overlap with each other, uh, filtering out uh, ROIs that were identified that are, that are unlikely to be actual cells. Uh, we tr to perform an eye tracking algorithm, temporarily align all of the all of the signals that we recorded from, and we package them into an NWB file. And then there's a procedure of, of cell matching across multiple sessions that takes place. And so at the end of the day, basically all of the every single individual experiment session, all of the data from an experiment session gets packaged into an NWB file. This is a neurodata without borders uh, file, a, a file standard that was uh, developed a few years ago, um, strongly influenced by the, the Allen Institute. Um, the data that are in, that's in each of these files includes a maximum projection image, uh, which, we'll, which we'll see a little bit in, in detail later, masks for the individual cells, what the raw fluorescence traces are, um, the changes in fluorescence, stimulus information, templates that are associated with the stimulants, uh, other behavioral covariates such as the mouse's running speed, um, and, and other data to help, uh, and, and metadata associated with the, with the experiment to permit the you know, survey level um, analysis. So experiments get uh, combined into an experiment container. So for any given, uh, any given experiment container, uh, we have, basically we have, we have six different types of visual stimuli that we present. Gratings that are drifting across the screen, gratings that are static and are fixed on the screen, uh, noise, which is locally sparse to facilitate retinotopic, um, retinotopic uh, identification. Uh, individual images that are natural scenes that are presented to the mouse. Uh, movies with natural statistics, as well as a gray screen for spontaneous activity. There are three different uh, experimental sessions. There are STEM A session, STEM B session, and STEM C session, which contain blocks of each of these, um, of each of these different types of stimuli. And each of these uh, sessions is approximately one hour. So for any given, uh, any given field of view that's included in the data set, um, we have, we have re recordings from those same cells across these three, uh, or from the same field of view across these three different sessions. So what's in the full data set? So the Alden Brain Observatory, we've got six different Cree lines in the data set. Uh, the different Cree lines themselves have different uh, patterns of projection across the different layers of visual cortex. And so some Cree lines are, are, are only relevant in certain layers to record from. And so uh, we have three different uh, depths that we target for, uh, for recording across the six different visual areas. Um, and so this little, this little table here tells you how much data is in uh, each level. And so, so far with our release, uh, the data that's accessible on the, on the website and, and by, for download right now includes 39,796 individual neurons. And so we can go to observatory.brainmap.org um, and get a, get a sense for what this, uh, what this data looks like. So um, we can, uh, for any given cell in the data set, we can open up this tab that says cells. And this is basically um, a large database of all of the individual cells that we've recorded from. Oops, you can't see what I can see. Okay. Um, so in this data set, we have this, uh, every, every row in this, in this table is, is a different cell with a bunch of metrics uh, and, and visualizations that have been extracted from it um, that characterize the, the tuning and, the, and what that cell seems to encode about the, about the external visual world. We also have recorded from 
uh, entire populations of cells simultaneously. So on the experiments tab, uh, each population of cells, each experiment, has particular statistics that define the entire population of cells. Um, so the distributions of orientation selectivity within a given experimental container, the preferred orientation of all the cells in the field of view, um, the, the representational similarity, how similar um, does the population respond to, uh, to itself uh, across different types of stimuli. And so all of these have been uh, characterized and loaded up on the website for, um, for you to explore and to identify interesting and unique experiments that are worth further exploration. But of course, what we're all here for is uh, is is to get into the data ourselves, into the into the Python uh, data analysis toolkit. Um, so the Allen SDK, as uh, as Nick highlighted, um, is our is kind of the Allen Institute's one stop shop for getting access to this data. We have a particular cache, uh, the Brain Observatory cache, that uh, lets you download the data and store subsets of the data locally. Um, we're actually not going to take advantage of the of the that um, of the cache because we're going to take advantage of our AWS setup that uh, already supports the cache. So, um, if you want to follow along, I'm going to post this into this message, this uh, link into the Neurohack Academy uh, Slack channel. Looks like somebody posted about our Nick and I's talk on Talk Python to me. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so if you uh, so so if you go to this go to this link, you can also just do a Google search for Allen SDK uh, AWS, and it should be the very first thing that pops up. And um, we have a, there, there's a, a page on our on our wiki that defines how to um, how to spin up an AWS instance to get access to this data. Um, and so we're going to walk through that I, because uh, because I, I was here uh, Wednesday morning when when we all got our um, AWS account set up. I know that you guys have AWS accounts. Um, so so let's walk through this. Should only take about uh, should only take uh, five ten minutes or so. Um, so uh, on this uh, on this page, uh, partway down is a nice big button that says Launch Stack. And what this is going to do is this is going to to take us through uh, basically our our awesome uh, software engineers, in particular at Nika. Um, I don't know what Nika's last name is. Hezzinia. Yeah. So Nick, Nika. Um, uh, got us set up with a um, took, taking advantage of um, of some AWS infrastructure to help uh, spin up a, a notebook environment that that automatically connects you to the S3 bucket. Um, so we have um, the the S3 bucket is public. This is thanks to the generosity of the um, AWS uh, Open Data Sets uh, program that they are sponsoring this data um, as one of their open data sets. And so. Um, if we click uh, Launch Stack, I'm going to hold down Control to make sure that it pops up in a uh, in a new window. Um, I'm going to get a page that looks something like this. How many of you got, how many of you are follow, going to follow along for this? Can you get, okay, I'll I'll check in with you guys and tell me to slow down if I need to slow down since uh, a few of you are doing this. Um, so basically, at, at this page, uh, this this sets up the template. And this automatically is linked to specify an S3 template URL, which is what we want. Um, so on this page, all you have to do is click Next. This page is an important page for us today. Okay, so in this page, we need to specify the, t the details of this stack and notebook instance that we're going to spin up. This has to be unique for the account. We have one account, which is UW. E science. So if everybody punches the same thing in here, it's not going to work. Whoever's the first one to type in something here is going to is going to claim that space. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take for our stack name. Uh, you all have have usernames that are already associated with uh, with all of this. So for your stack name, do uh, Allen Brain Observatory uh, dash your uh, username that you've been using for your AWS stuff. And then under here for parameters for your username, uh, also t type in your username. Does that make sense? Uh, does it matter? Can we run 
this under Ohio or do you have to Oh, this, um, this you will only work in Oregon. I think that it will work in Ohio. It's, uh, this should, uh, we should do this in Oregon though. Okay. The data is on the S3 bucket in Oregon, so you'll be closer to the data and Amazon won't have to pay as much for egress um, if you do this in, uh, in Oregon. I don't know what stage yeah, I already have this set up on. Can we just add to the, these resources? Can we add uh, Neurohack Dash? The username Neurohack Dash. Yeah. We, we will want to figure out how much. I'll actually. We pay later, so we'll look for that. Yeah, well, we have, a, we have a, on the next page, I can do, do the owner thing. Okay. And so I'll do it there. Is that good? Uh, for the tags. Yeah. Okay. So, Allen Brain Observatory Neuromusic, and then parameter is Neuromusic. So, I'm going to go to the next page. And so now to help, uh, uh, to help Ariel out, we'll call this, uh, for the tag, we want to do um, specify yourself as the owner of this, um, of this asset, okay? So for the key is owner and value Neurohack music, or, or the Neurohack Neuromusic for me, uh, but Neurohack username. Everybody good? Or I guess anybody not good? So I'm going to click next. Um, now, uh, down here at the bottom, there's a, a button that we need to click to acknowledge that AWS is going to create resources. It's going to start building stuff that we don't have control over, but we're paying for anyway, um, basically. So this is where you kind of have to trust that Nika did her work appropriately and isn't, isn't doing anything that's, gonna, um, that's going to, to use too much money, um, but we're, we're acknowledging that, 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 that we're going to let the, um, the stack builder do this. Um, and so I'm going to click Create, and it takes me to this, uh, to this page. Now, um, this is going to, so there, there's kind of two things that get, get defined right now. There's a stack that gets defined that actually is building out the stack of, of resources it's going to build. And then there's actually the notebook instance. So if we go back to the, um, if we go back to the, the wiki, there's one little, one little button here, one little link here. It says you can check the status of the notebook instance here. If you click on that, and this should be the same for everybody. Um, there we go. So here's all the notebook instances that are getting spun up right now. So this is why, this is why we needed to maintain some uniqueness in defining these, is because this is where we end up with a, well, this is one of the places that we could end up with a collision. Um, and so um, as, these, uh, as these go through, these are going to start spinning up. And currently, they're all listed as, as pending. So it's going to take probably about, I think it takes around five minutes or so for this thing to fully build out. Um, so while that's happening, um, first, does anybody have any questions? Um, the, the, the step just prior to, to pull this thing up, you mean? There should be, on, on this page, there's not really anything to click on. This is, uh, this is kind of just giving the status of all of the, all of the stacks. Once you, once you logged in, once you click that create button on that last page, that was the, um, that, that will start making the, the notebook. What you want to do now is click on this uh, thing to, once you, if you've hit create, you want to click on this button to check the status of the notebook that pulls up this, uh, this uh, console under Amazon SageMaker. And this lists all of, the, all of the notebook instances. So what you want to do is keep an eye out for the notebook that has your, um, that has your username under here. So if I do a search here for Neuromusic, is this going to pop up with mine somewhere? Scott Cole. Yeah, I wonder if it. 
Is anybody having trouble with? Yeah, it's probably an exception. Oh, no. OK. Well. Yeah, I think it's starting to uh, roll back on these things. <sighs> OK, well, that was too much. <laughs> Lucky, luckily, for those of you who, who were able to get through, maybe uh, uh, y'all can try to peek over the shoulder of, uh, of people who are through. But I do have, um, this, is, this is my like, um, you know, cooking show where I've already got one that's, that's actually set up that I can use. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull the, the, the roasted turkey out of the oven here um, and, and give you an idea. Oh, but actually, but this roasted turkey one doesn't have the pull request that I just had Nick, um, I just had Nick deploy. So. Some of them are coming online. Some of them are coming online? Okay. No, you're costing Ariel a bunch of money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So, yeah, and basically, to, so to answer your question as far as closing them goes, um, on this, and, and I mean, this is probably something that we can also, um, I'll coordinate with Ariel and we can maybe do it tonight too, is that it's really, um, you know, basically, the, there's, a, there's a stop button to stop any of these. Um, so it's, it's pretty easy to, um, to, to roll them back or to, to shut them down. Okay, nice. All the, ones, all the ones that made it through, all the ones that didn't get throttled. Yeah. Yeah. This is, I think this one specifically is on a, like a large, um, which is not super cheap, I don't think, but I don't, I'm not sure off the top of my head. Okay, so um, for those of you who, who got in there, um, there should be, um, actually I'm going, to, I'm going to steal somebody's uh, just to poke around. Uh, let's see. Uh, C. Torseri, who's that? Okay, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna. I just want to see if there's a notebook in here and kind of show people how to load this up. All right. So I just clicked on that. Um, wait, where'd it go? Oh, sorry. So I'm gonna click open over here, and this is going to. Um, to open up the, um, the notebook. And down here is a, is a uh, there's a notebook in there that's Neuro Academy 2018 Workshop, and that's what I'm gonna go through right now. So I'm gonna go through it locally, um, but it should work in the cloud also. Okay. All right, you can, you can carry on. You can have your, I, I don't want any collisions in your uh, stuff, so, okay. Oh yeah, so it's going to ask you, yeah, I forgot about that. So uh, conda underscore python2 is the kernel you want to use. It doesn't, it's not, I need to, I need to fix it so that it discovers the kernel properly. But um, yeah, conda underscore python2 is the kernel that we're, that we're going to work with. Okay. Um, so the... Uh, to start out, we import some, uh, you know, a bunch of uh, fun Python stuff, NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib. Um, and the first thing we do is uh, import the Brain Observatory cache. I, right here, have defined my own manifest file. The manifest file defines where the data is. Uh, your guys' notebooks are, are set up so that it's going to, you don't have to define anything. It's going to automatically discover that the, um, that the data is on the S3 bucket that's connected to your instance. Does that make sense? Um, so uh, since I'm doing this locally, I'm defining exactly where my data is stored locally. Um, but you guys don't have to worry about that right now. So we can, uh, once we instantiate this, uh, this class, we can start um, 
uh, start calling methods on the on the brain observatory cache. You can kind of think of the brain observatory cache as is taking the it's it's defining all the data and it's sort of like a, a, a database and caching mechanism for the entire brain observatory data set. So I can uh, call this method get all targeted structures that returns all of the targeted regions in the brain observatory data set. Does anybody recognize any of these visual structures? These are all using the Allen Institute standard ontology for brain regions. So uh, VisP is what is uh, perhaps more commonly known as V1, that is visual primary. Uh, VisL, visual lateral, VisPM, uh, posterior medial. Um, so this is the these are these are all the all the different areas of uh, of visual cortex. If you want to see these structures in 3D, go to the brainstorm because these acronyms are the same ones that we have that brainstorm. Yeah. Um, we can call BOC uh, get all imaging depths to figure out what all of the depths are that all of the experiments were imaged at. We can call get all Cree lines to explore all the Cree lines. So we have six Cree lines, multiple imaging depths, multiple different regions. BOC, uh, get all stimuli to see all of the stimuli that are, that, all the different types of stimuli that were used in these experiments. So as I had talked about earlier, a given experiment container, describe an experiment container is a set of three experiments at the same field of view. Um, so the, targeting the same area and the same imaging depth and, um, and, and should have the same field, the same cells within the field of view. Uh, each experiment container, so the container of three experiments, has its own unique ID. So we can define, we can, we can search for a visual area. So we can say, okay, we want to look at get uh, all the experiment containers that are associated with VisAL uh, from cucks to mice. And we can run a query uh, using get experiment containers and say, OK, I want to get all the experiment containers where my targeted structures are, sorry, where my targeted structures are of that visual area and where my Cree lines are of that Cree line. And I can, this returns a, uh, this returns a, oops, I forgot to, this re returns a list of dictionaries, which I can dump into a pandas data frame in order to um, see, okay, I have 10 experiment containers that fit this query. I've got 10 experiment containers that are uh, um, uh, Cux2 mice recorded in uh, VisAL. And we can see that these are across different imaging depths, the different mice. One experiment you might notice has a tag um, that there are epileptiform events that were identified. So this was, uh, this was you know, through our, our QC process and after we collected lots of data, we identified that, that some mice were having uh, 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 suspicions of epilepsy. And so these experiments that, that might be concerning, if, that's, uh, if that might affect the data analysis you're doing, have been tagged. Um, so if we identify one experiment container ID, we can get the um, call get OPhys experiments of that container ID, and this returns the experiments that are associated with that container ID. So with that container ID, we have three individual experiments that are associated with that container ID, and each of those has its own um, metadata that's associated with it. So this particular, um, uh, this particular data set, we can see that the, the first container uh, the animal was 102 days old on its acquisition day when this data set was acquired. 
The next container, it was 104 days old. The next container, it was 103 days old. So we could get a sense of, of how these experiments were recorded. Um, if we want to further filter this, let's say we only want the experiment containers where we've recorded from natural scenes, where we, where we presented natural images to the mice. So we can add that as an additional query, and now we get the one experiment container, uh, or the one experiment, the one session from this experiment container in which natural scenes were presented. And we'll make that, we'll call that session ID, and we'll dive deeper into that particular data set now. Any questions? So once we have identified a session ID that we want to explore, we can call this method get OFIS experiment data. And what this returns is an actual data set object that lets us have access to the NWB file behind it. This method, if you are calling this method locally and on your own personal computer after you've installed the Allen SDK, this is gonna go and grab like a hundred some odd megabyte file down from, um, from the Allen Institute servers. Um, for you guys right now, it's just gonna reach over to the S3 bucket and, and know that it's there. So, um, but this is, uh, this is the point that you can, that stuff can start to slow down if you are uh, doing this on your own. So this data set object now, um, this is basically behind the scenes, this has, this has connected, downloaded and connected to one of these NWB files. And NWB does not currently have a stable uh, API, uh, a stable read API. Um, there's, a, there's a new version of uh, PyNWB that's in, in the works to be able to, to standardize this and stabilize this. Um, but this data set object, it's really the NWB file is just an HDF5 file with a particular schema associated with it. And um, this data set object basically has a bunch of convenience methods and convenience wrappers for getting that data back out. And that's what we're going to go through right now. So we can call get cell specimen IDs on this data set object, and this gives us the uh, unique identifiers for each of the cells that was recorded within this session. So we can see we've got a lot of cells. We've got 100 some odd cells in this, uh, in this data set. We can call get max projection to read out the, um, the maximum projection image of the data set. The maximum projection image is after you take the entire calcium movie and for every single, the, after you've motion corrected it, for every single pic, pixel, you take the max value across time. Um, and so this gives us basically a uh, uh, projection of the of the of the strongest fluorescence. So this gives us some sense of the cells that are that are in the field of view. So you can see we've got a bunch of these you know, a bunch of these bright circles, these big bright circles that are um, that are, are are cell bodies of cells in this area. We've also got a lot of little tiny bright circles. These tend to be you know dendrites and and um, and things that we're we're not uh, not interested in. And so we have gone through our. Uh, Engineers have pushed through um, you know, segmentation algorithms to identify um, individual ROIs. And so we can call get ROI mask array to, jet, to pull out the array of masks for each ROI. So there's 174 cells, 174 ROIs in this data set. And um, over the 512 uh, by 512 range of the image, and so we can sum across that um, across all of the ROIs to expose the um, this uh, the ROI masks into a single plane. And so here are all the cells that were identified and extracted uh, within this experiment. Everybody wants to get into real neural data, though, right? So, who, doesn't, uh, who, does, who does not know what, uh, what, I, what I mean if I say delta F over F or DF over F? Awesome. Okay, so um, in 
uh, the kind of one of the key pieces of data, the key time series that we're interested in in this data is uh, DF over F. So this is the change in fluorescence, the relative change in fluorescence at any given time. Um, so we can call uh, get df over f traces, and this returns our, uh, our, time, uh, our, our time series uh, time axis, as well as an array of df over f traces. So this is uh, the, the shape of dff is 174, so the 174 cells, 174 ROIs in this field of view, and then um, you know 100,000 time points. So these are this data is collected at um, at uh, 60 hertz or 30 hertz, 30 hertz over an hour. And so we can uh, plot um, the first 50, um, the, the, the time series of the, of the first 50 ROIs um, of the first 50 cells in this data set. Um, does anybody, uh, and we can see already, so, so we've just plot 50 cells and we can see that there's some structure to this data already, right? There's a, there's a little bit of structure. There are, um, this is, you know, this is one hour, this is the full hour of recording, um, but there's, there's structure, right? There's these time epochs where a bunch of these cells are doing, these cells seem to all be doing the same thing. You know, there's, uh, these cells are kind of doing the same thing in these two epochs and then this one goes crazy while this, these ones are kind of quiet. Um, what's going on here? So we can dive in a little bit and start to extract, you know, what are the actual stimuli that are being presented for during the 60 minutes? So there's a table. Uh, we, on, again, on the data set object, we can call get stimulus epic table, which returns our stimulus epic table. So this is the, the high level, um, which types of stimuli were presented at any, any given chunk of time within the experiment. And so we can see that first, we, the, the static grading stimulus was presented. That started at, um, at timestamp, uh, at, at, at index, time index uh, 746, and ended at index 15,195. So this is the, this is the, these are the indices into the recording in which that type of stimulus was being presented. It was followed by natural scenes, which was followed by spontaneous activity, natural scenes, static gratings. So we can um, figure out what the unique um, items are in this, uh, in this stimulus array, and then overlay them with different colors over the entire experiment. And sure enough, we can see that the, the similarity in structure between these cells in this epoch versus this epoch versus th this epoch is due to the fact that they were similar stimuli that were being presented. So this is the, these are stimulus epochs, right? These are the large scale, you know, which, which type of stimuli were being presented at any given time. If we want to go down to a trial by trial, or like a, a stimulus presentation by stimulus presentation level, that is in a stim the stimulus table. So each, um, each type of stimulus that was presented has a different stimulus table associated with it. So we can get the stimulus table for natural scenes um, for this experiment. And this is a pandas data frame of every presentation of natural scenes images. Here, start again is the index into, time, into, the, into the data, into when things happened. Frame here is, um, is an index into an image stack. It's an index into a separate stack of images for this stimulus. So this tells us that image 81 was presented on, you know, on, started, was presented on this frame and turned off on this, or sorry, was presented on this, at this time within the experiment um, and was terminated at this time in the experiment. Does everybody get that? Sort of? So I'm gonna, so to, 
what exactly are these images and why is this called frame? Well, we can also get the actual stimulus template for the natural scenes. So we can call get stimulus template and this pulls out the actual images that were presented to the mouse. So the shape of this is 118, 118 images by 918 by 1174. And so that's basically the, not exactly the size of the screen because there's like warping and stuff that happens, but um, that, that's roughly the, the image that was presented. And so for any given trial, we can um, look at the frame value, grab a, uh, the frame value for a particular location, and then plot what the image was that was presented to the animal. So then we can look for all, um, every time that this particular stimulus was uh, presented in this session. And now we can plot every time that stimulus is presented. So that's what each of these vertical red lines is. We've got other covariates with this data. So the mouse is on a, on a wheel. It helps keep them happy and comfortable. So we can call get running speed. And for any given time point of our recording, we can also see how fast the animal was running on the wheel, what their motion was like. And so, for example, we can see that you know, later here at this later epoch, there's activity um, that uh, doesn't seem to be present earlier in the session. And if we plot, extract the running speed, it seems like that might be a covariate that explains uh, some of the activity of some of the cells um, in the visual cortex. We can also get metadata associated with each cell. So um, for we have metrics that are associated with each cell that have been extracted. So calling get cell specimens on the original, the, the brain observatory cache data, we can get um, cell specimens is all 37,000 cells in this data set. Um, and we can uh, get all of the, um, all the metrics that have been, been calculated for this data. So there's 60 columns in this data frame. Some of it's metadata, others, others is derived metrics. So we can then, all of these uh, identifiers are co-registered, so we can filter that cell specimens table according to um, the cells that are associated with that container ID. Skip that. So if we dive into a particular image, this image is, is 22. We can say, OK, I want to find cells that prefer this image. And so we can filter um, of the cells that we've recorded from. Subset is what we had uh, defined up here. This is the subset of all of the of all of the metrics that have been computed for all cells. We can uh, filter that by only grabbing the, um, those in which the p-value for natural scenes uh, responsivity is less than 0.05. So cells that, that we're confident are responding to uniquely to different images, and which we have computed that their preferred image the image that they respond most strongly to is this image, is image number 22. And when we do that, we get out uh, three cells that are um, of this experiment that we're looking at that prefer this image. 
So then we can identify um, which we know that we know the ID, the unique identifier of this cell globally, but which uh, index in the delta over f uh, numpy array does that correspond to? And so we have a get cell specimen indices uh, method on the data set object that gives us the indices for any set of cell specimen IDs that we pass in. So we can pass in one cell specimen ID and uh, grab the first item in what that returns and that gives us our cell index. And so now we can plot just that, um, now we can plot just that cell instead of all the cells as well as the um, when the image was presented. Yeah. Oh. And then, uh, then we can flip it around and say, OK, for each presentation of this image, what's the average response? What's the, what's the response of this cell? And we can get, uh, extract the, the, the response to the, um, the local DF over F response to a given cell. Any questions at this point? So um, the final thing that I want to show you, so this basically, at this point, like this level gives you, this has all that, all the access, access to all of the data. You know, this is, this is everything that is in, um, in these files and how to query them with some of the pre-computed metrics that, 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 we've, um, that we've computed. Uh, for a lot of uh, a lot of questions, um, there's an intermediate step that um, you know a lot of things that lots of people want to do. So, inspired by uh, by Eva's talk earlier, I um, uh, pulled in a, a, a simple example of of doing some dimensionality reduction and decoding with this data set. So we have these uh, analysis modules that facilitate uh, certain uh, exploring the data in particular ways. So one of the, the key, th so this is, I'm going to demonstrate how the, the natural scenes analysis object works. So I can import the natural scenes analysis object and give it this data set. And this will give me a new, a new object that does not give me access to the raw data, all the raw data we get through the data set object. This gives me access to sort of pre-computed um, or, or predefined computations and predefined uh, extractions of data from the analysis object. So for example, um, on, this, uh, on this image right here, you know, we have multiple trials here, multiple image presentations, and the magnitude of the response varies. If I wanted to get just one value to say, okay, how strongly does this cell respond to this image on this trial? Um, I can take the average, you know, the average response over some window, for example. Um, and so I can, uh, for the natural scenes object, I can get my, my stim table. This is that, uh, uh, that same table that we looked at earlier. And there's a, an, uh, an attribute called the mean sweep response. And what this is, is this gives us the average uh, response to every sweep, to every image presentation. And so this takes a few seconds because this computes uh, from, the, from the data and it, and it read, loops through, uh, pulls out responses, um, and, uh, and drops them um, into a data frame. The data frame that it generates, every row is, a, is an individual trial, a different image presentation, and each column is the response of a given cell, of a given neuron. So this is precisely the data frame that Eva was talking about earlier that, that fed into her analysis of, um, you know, to do dimensionality reduction on the, on the population response. Should have cached this. Cached. 
actually have the, uh, <coughs> the pull request open right now for cash and these in the rare superstore cash. Gotcha. But I think the soundtrack was out last week and I couldn't get it. Maybe right next week. What do you mean tagged? Yeah. Um, yes and no. Not by us. Um, you know, we, at least in the experimental design, there is no intention of assigning semantic content to the images. Um, that said, uh, and it's in the white paper where each image came from, but they came from like the Berkeley Image Segmentation Database and one or two other databases. And I think it, that one of those does have labels associated with it. So you can do the work to go back through and figure out what the original labels were that were associated with the, um, with the different images. And I think that there have been people who have done some, um, yeah, some, some analysis of sort of like animate versus inanimate um, uh, objects in, the, uh, in some of these images. Man, this is not, this is slow. Any other questions while this does its thing? Yeah. Is there a guideline to converting our own data to That's a good question. Um, so the NWB format is, um, is yeah, I mean, so, so the NWB format is oriented towards um, uh, electrophysiology, spiking data, um, LFP, and, um, uh, and, and calcium imaging largely. There's some efforts to, to do like ECOG data, and um, it's not really well suited to EEG yet. Um, but there are, for the new version of NWB, for Pi NWB, um, yeah, there's some good documentation and it's getting better on, on how to coerce your data into, the, uh, into this file format. Um, I would say that the two, the two biggest hurdles is that NWB enforces uh, very rigorously that you uh, co-register everything to the same time domain to a single master clock. You have to do that to analyze any of this data anyway, um, but that's, that's, one, um, that's probably one of the, the first pain points that, that people run into. Um, the other thing is that it's, it has a fairly complex schema. So for it, it expects a lot of the metadata and a lot of the, um, um, so for example, for this calcium imaging data set, I can't give you a valid NWB file that only has the DF over F traces. I have to give you a file that has the DF over F traces and uh, ROI masks and the, a, ma a reference image in order for that file to conform to the NWB standard. And so that's probably the other thing that, is, that, that can be a hurdle is that it, there's a, a little bit of a steep learning curve for understanding what exactly the schema is that you need to get your data into it. Um, but it's all open source. We've got some very active and enthusiastic developers that are, that are working on it um, right now and improving it. Uh, this new reboot is, is worlds better than the state of NWB two years ago. Um, so I think there's a lot of promise. Okay. All right. I, maybe my computer's just slow. So I'm going to just skim through this to, to give an overview then of the, because I've already got everything loaded up here. Um, so I'm not going to wait. I, I'm going to I'm going to stop the live portion of this uh, presentation. Um, but basically, this uh, this uh, this matrix, um, this data frame that that gets loaded up, um, you can basically pass this straight into PCA. You know, you can drop this straight into Scikit-Learn, and do dimensionality reduction on it, uh, project the the population response into two dimensions. Um, you can see there's this kind of major sort of bimodal. Um, uh, component of the, of the activity. Um, I can label these according to the image that was presented at any given time. And on the surface, it doesn't look like there's a whole lot of stimulus information here. Um, but if we go through and actually do, uh, do a classification, so we can take like a K nearest neighbors classification, define our classifier um, and, uh, and, and build it out across validation of this. Um, the, the 
uh, ability to decode these images is about five times greater than chance. So chance is one over 120, one over 118, um, and, uh, and, and it is possible to, to decode stimulus information out of this, uh, out of this population response. Um, this, is, uh, this, this value is, is on the ballpark of, uh, of the range of values that we, that we see in this data, but one of the key questions, I mean, this is one experiment container. Um, so this is now you know, basically one of the, the big um, uh, opportunities of the Allen Institute data set is that I don't just have one experiment container, I have hundreds of experiment containers. You know, I have different types of cells, different, um, different visual areas. And so there's a, a, a great opportunity to be able to explore this full survey and explore what the coding properties are of, um, of individual cells and populations of cells across this entire data set. And um, so to sort of wrap up the, the presentation, um, in, um, so we're, we're wrapping up final data collection of this data set. Um, what is currently on our website is um, 39,796 39, neurons, um, 200 individual data sets, 200, or 200 in experiment containers, so 600 individual experiments. Um, for our final data release of this, of this data set in October, we're looking at over uh, 60,000 neurons, uh, doubling the number of Cree lines that we're recording from. And then looking towards 2019, we'll be, uh, we'll be releasing data sets, uh, including uh, mice that are actually, um, have been trained to make decisions about what they're seeing on the screen, um, and uh, high density electrophysiology um, using NeuroPixels probes, where we can have simultaneous recordings of uh, 700 some odd neurons uh, across six different visual areas, um, up to six different visual areas simultaneously. Um, and finally, we have uh, just, uh, just had a soft launch and we're about to start kind of reaching out to some of the power users we know to try to, to, to start building out um, a full community around people who are using this data. So we currently have, um, there have been, I want to say 12 preprints and uh, publications even before we published our, um, released our, the, the preprint for our platform paper defining the entire data set. Um, that, uh, that have been released. So Eva's published on it, um, and, um, and a few others have, have published on the, this data already. Um, and so it is, uh, it is ripe for, for exploration, for testing models, um, for developing new methods, um, and we're trying to build out a community of people who have worked with this data to help each other, um, to, to avoid pitfalls and learn from each other um, moving forward. So with that, I'd like to thank, uh, thank you guys all for your time. Thank um, the, it, it's, it's hard to explain the, the scale of, the, of this data and in particular the teams that are involved in generating not just the Brain Observatory, but all of these, uh, all of these data sets, um, none of which would be possible without the generosity of Paul Allen. Um, and uh, so yeah, thank you all for your time. <laughs>